we meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Welcome to another episode of the Energy Impact Podcast. We're joined today by DJ Nordquist, her first ever podcast appearance, uh, which is we're flattered. Um, she's done all kinds of crazy things and is doing all kinds of amazing things. So I don't even know what title to use for, even when I asked. But DJ, welcome to the show. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, okay. Well, so before we get into all the amazing things we were talking about before we started recording, tell us a little bit about you. Where, where are you from? Uh, I'm originally from Manhattan, New York City. Uh, I joke that I, uh, yes, I grew up and I survived in the mean street yeah. of New York. Uh, went to uh, college uh, about as far away from New York as I could find. I went to Stanford undergrad and then uh, started to make my way back east, did my master's at Northwestern, uh, and then uh, ended up in D.C., uh, lived overseas for about six years, uh, and then came back to D.C. Wow. Yeah, that's the opposite of generally we'll hear people that like, grew up elsewhere and then moved to New York and you seem to go the opposite. What what was the um, yeah, what was the impetus for Stanford? Um, I just wanted to experience um, a different, you know, living in a different part of the country. Um, you know, I'm an yeah, I was an East Coast person and I thought, you know, uh, why not check out the West Coast? So that's how I ended up at Stanford. And I, I kind of missed like the Internet age <laughs> Like, I just slightly, like, I, if I were just slightly younger, maybe I'd still be out there working at some big tech company. Um, did you know what you wanted to study, or was it, like, purely a geography thing? Like, okay, anywhere in California, let's go check out the surf. Um, no, I mean, I was I was specifically interested in, in uh, communications, um, theoretical communications, uh, and, uh, and psychology, and uh, Stanford had um, really great departments there, and um, also, to be frank, one of my best friends from high school um, is Italian, and she said, you need to take Italian and study in Florence, and, uh, and she has a house in Florence, and so I was like, okay. <laughs> Amazing. So, so was that applying to school? You were like, I know I can do a semester in Florence, and so was like I that mean, was literally. No, I mean, you know, after the fact, she was like, "You need to, you need to come visit." So. <laughs> um, okay, amazing. So theoretical communications, uh, then Northwestern. So what? Yeah, was that still communications? Like, talk that us was, through kind of. Yeah, uh, my master's was in in journalism, and then um, I uh, the last part of my program uh, was at, at DC. Uh, There's a newsroom in DC. Uh, and so I uh, worked in D.C. for three months and uh, decided I liked it here and um, sort of accidentally ended up working on Capitol Hill. And, uh, and that was my first foray into policy. And then I've sort of been in and out of policy, um, you know, either studying policy or doing policy uh, for most of my life. Fascinating. Well, yeah. OK, tell us tell us about that journey. So what what was that first experience in D.C. like and what about it? Um, made you say, yeah, this is what I want to do and where I want to go? Um, well, so I've always um, wanted to try to help other people uh, and, uh, tr you know, kind of corny, make the world a better place. Uh, and so that's how, um, you know, when I started my, I started working on the, the Senate side uh, and then moved over to the House side and um, got my sort of first taste of, um, of Capitol Hill, <laughs> um, which uh, was very foreign to me, you know, being from New York. New York is focused on, you know, finance uh, and really the arts. Uh, and so the political world was, uh, was new to me, but um, I found it uh, super interesting and uh, I've uh, sort of stuck with it. And did you um, like, did you notice that that perspective from finance was part of your strength uh, coming to a slightly different environment? Or did you feel that they were just sort of different things and just an observation that you had? 
No, um, I mean, I didn't really get into economic policy until later. Um, I had done, uh, I worked, I did a bunch of domestic policy. Um, uh, when was that? In the 2000s. Um, and then and then from there, ended up doing econ policy. Uh, and so I've done a lot of econ policy uh, since then. Um, okay, great. Well, yeah, let's dig into then what you were actually doing over time. So uh, domestic policy, like tell us, tell us more about that and where you started, sure. like just a, just a staffer, or like specific assignments, like what did yeah, you work on? Um, so uh, my first, uh, you know, other than Capitol Hill, I then sort of lived overseas and was in the private sector and then worked at um, a bunch of think tanks and then uh, went back into government on the executive branch side. Uh, and so my first, uh, my first job on an executive branch was at the Department of Education. Uh, and so worked uh, quite a bit on No Child Left Behind, higher education, higher education finance, um, you know, a bunch, a bunch of different, um, you know, pieces of the education uh, portfolio. Um, and a lot of education research. Um, I, I'm kind of a research nerd. And so I got very interested in the Institute of Educational Sciences, which was stood up when I first got um, to the Department of Education and the, and the founding director and I are, you know, still friends. So <laughs> we worked together at Brookings for a while too. Wow. Yeah. That, I mean, I only remember that sort of tangentially, um, but certainly a cool high profile program and one that's so critical. How did the evolution then of your education work and research and policy transition to energy? Or was there an interim step or? Um, uh, yeah. yeah, well, so I mean, I've sort of, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> unfortunately there really hasn't been a grand plan. I've sort of gone where the wind has blown me. Um, and so far it's uh, it's worked out pretty well, but um, I moved from the Department of Education uh, to then I moved over to the FDIC um, where I was the deputy chief of staff uh, and uh, ran their public affairs office. And uh, so, you know, worked at FDIC, learned a lot about banking regulation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then Hurricane Katrina hit and um, uh, the chairman of the FDIC and I and his chief of staff um, set up the Bush, uh, it was the Bush um, uh, Clinton uh, foundation Bush 41 uh, and Clinton did a foundation to try to help uh, you know uh, put uh, New Orleans back together again and then from there uh, the White House asked the chairman of the FDIC to actually run the Katrina recovery they started a, a recovery office to try to coordinate the 19 federal agencies that had a piece of trying to rebuild uh, after the hurricane uh, and then from there, I moved over to HUD because HUD had a lot of the recovery money. So moved over to HUD and I had always had an interest in, you know, urban development having, you know, grown up in a big city. Um, and then from there, uh, moved to Brookings where I worked at Brookings and economic studies for nine years. So that was sort of the transition from mainly like domestic policy to more of econ policy. Um, economic studies is, um, uh, one of the older parts of Brookings, and uh, it's all PhD economists. So um, I sort of learned about academia um, uh, from that job and became more of a research nerd and really loved the work. Uh, and uh, then from there, um, I ended up uh, working on the presidential transition and uh, worked at the Council of Economic Advisors in the White House. Um, and so was chief of staff there for about two and a half years and then was confirmed to be the executive director for the United States at the World Bank. So I voted the US as the largest shareholder at the bank and I voted uh, the US shares. And now I'm back in think tank land. <laughs> Wow, I'm. Uh, we could spend probably a whole day talking about all of those experiences, <laughs> and personalities. Um, and I should say that that's when the White House. Uh, I mean, I had done a little bit of energy work at Brookings, um, and then you know, working at the Council of Economic Advisors, a um, lot of energy research there, and then at the World Bank, sort of seeing it on the international level and looking at the green transition, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Walk. Um, so, what years were you at the World Bank then? I was there uh, 2019 to 2021. Okay, yeah, so pretty recent, a lot of capital flowing into the space. Yeah. Uh, you got you got pre-COVID and post-COVID <laughs> exposure to that experience. Yeah, well, uh, I was there during, yeah. Right I mean, over the- Pre and then yeah. nothing but COVID and we were, yeah. you know, 
which is very, it's very difficult. I mean, I, I don't know. Some people seem to thrive in remote environments and some workplaces I think are perfect for remote. Uh, I don't think the World Bank was one of those places, at least the board. If you're doing the research, sure, you can be working from home. But if you're working at, at the board where you're trying to pull together coalitions to vote with you on things, it's very difficult to do that remotely. They're, you know, pre-COVID, we'd have our board meetings and people would sort of congregate and have coffees and, you know, whatever. And it was just uh, easier to sort of get uh, things done that way. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, and helpful background, sort of the U.S. shares, perhaps for our audience, you know, give the sort of 20 second description on like what the World Bank is. And then I, I'd love to sort of dive into the the politics of decision making and the and how that dovetailed with the energy transition. But like start from the top and then we'll we'll dig in. Okay. 20 seconds. <laughs> 60 seconds. You you can you can ignore my artificial barriers. <laughs> I mean it could take me hours to explain the World Bank. And I worked there for two years and I still don't know half of it. Um, so the World Bank is is a very, very large uh, multilateral organization. Uh, it is actually uh, a UN agency. Um, and uh, unlike uh, the UN, you know, uh, like the General Assembly and the Security Council, where every country has one vote, the World Bank is by shares. Um, and those shares are determined. It's a very complicated formula, um, which would take me hours to explain to you. But basically, the shares are based on how much how much money you've put in and, and your GDP and how much money you put in, in different places. There are actually five different units of the World Bank which I won't get into, but the, when you say the bank, it's the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. That's the main piece of the bank. There's also the International Development Association, and then there's IFC, International Finance uh, Corporation, which is the private sector seed part of the bank. Um, but uh, anyway, so there are- Interesting. So are those actually affiliates then of the World Bank, or those are just well, thought of as a separate- no, like, quasi So the, it's technically called the World Bank Group and so there are five entities under the World Bank umbrella. So those are three. Then there's ICSID, which is um, sort of uh, mediation. Uh, and then there's a accountability uh, part of it too. So, but the main, those are the main three that people talk about. Um, but the first part, IBRD, that's when you say the bank, that's what you mean. Um, IDA is for um, the poorest of the poor countries. And those are mainly grants versus um, IBRD. Those are mainly loans at concessional rates. And then IFC are you know, loans, but to the private sector. Um, so uh, shareholders- core thesis, core thesis of this organization um, is sort of to uh, manage geopolitical risk for, right? I mean, for the betterment well, of- So that's MEGA and that's okay. another part. That's, sorry, that's the part of the- yeah, yeah. Sorry, MEGA, if you're listening. <laughs> MEGA is Mutual Insurance Guaranteed Association. So that is, that is actually political risk insurance. Okay. Um, which a lot of corporations will take out uh, at the bank because if you're working in a developing country, there is um, oftentimes higher risk. Um, so, uh, I mean, you know, post, these are, you know, the World Bank and its sister organization, the IMF, our Bretton Woods organizations, they came out of that conference right after World War II. Um, you know, the IMF is, is focused on sort of finan global financial stability um, versus the World Bank, I'd say, is a little more of a micro look where they're, you know, funding projects in specific countries. Um, and so the World Bank is supposed to be this bottom up approach of, um, you know, hey, uh, I don't know, I'll just name a country like Liberia, they come to the World Bank and they say we really would like, you know, uh, a project to do better K-12 education for girls. And so they will negotiate with the bank on what that project looks like. The bank will spend probably about two years, the staff trying to figure out what the project should be working with the sovereign and then it comes up to the board for a vote. Um, so just to go back to the board and the shareholding, um, so unlike the UN, where every country has a vote, at the World Bank, it's by shareholding. So there are only 25 board seats for 189 countries. Um, there are six or seven, depending on how you count, um, constituencies or board seats that have just one country in them. The U.S. is one of them. So I used to joke because I was I sat next to my Mexican colleague and he would say, I represent Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, he'd list like his seven countries. I'd be like, I just, just the United States. That's it. Just, I just got one. It's a big one, but I got one. Yeah. So, uh, so, you know, US, France, UK, Germany, Japan, uh, China are all single constituencies. Uh, Russia was a single constituency. The Middle East constituency kicked Syria out. And so Russia took them. So they're, I guess, sort of not a single constituency technically anymore. Um, 
Uh, and then, so anyway, there are like for Africa, which is obviously a huge continent, they only have three executive directors for all their countries. So one, one of them had 23 countries in their constituency, one had 22 and one had three. And it's based on shareholding how much those countries put in. So the, the bigger the economy is, that's the constituency with the three, uh, the three countries versus the, the other ones. Uh, and then there's some weird combinations of constituencies. Again, I could spend a lot of time talking about yeah. it. Yeah, fascinating. <laughs> fascinating, like both, um, both helpful and more confusing at the same time. Yeah. Uh, but maybe talk about, um, but yeah, I guess so then talk about how the politics of decision making actually comes together. I mean, you're it's this massive institution, this massive goal, taking a micro bottoms up approach. I mean, how is there pretty good alignment? Like you kind of know where everyone's going to vote and it's pretty clear to the staff sort of what everyone's doing or is there this sort of political wind shifting on a- So on a, on the bank is supposed to be apolitical. Um, nothing is ever apolitical. Yeah. I mean, obviously yeah. most countries are going to vote, you know, in their own interest or try to help. Like for instance, if you're France, you sort of have this, you, I mean, I felt like the French have their little protect. And by the way, I'm a Francophile. I lived in, I lived in France. I love the French. They have their little, you know, sort of umbrella of former colonies that they like to protect. Um, and the other European countries sort of have that same thing going, um, uh, which was interesting because the, the, Mexican constituency. So there's an uh, an executive director and an alternate executive director, and these multi-country constituencies switch off which country has the seat. So Spain is in the same constituency as their former colonies, and so when I was there, Mexico had the had the um, top seat, and uh, uh, now and then it switched to Spain, uh, which is sort of interesting because at the World Bank, I had I guess <clears throat> being an American, even though I'd lived overseas. Um, I hadn't really spent much time. I mean, I lived in Thailand, which is a developing country, but I hadn't spent much time in Africa. Um, uh, and there's definitely a lot of discussion about colonialism at the World Bank. And so sort of the irony of having Spain uh, have the top seat for all their former constituencies uh, sometimes doesn't go over very well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. How could it possibly even be remotely a political, right? I mean, <laughs> I guess what's the, in yeah, what, what is the intent of creating an apolitical organization and then putting a clearly sort of politically biased lens of people as the board. Like how, like how do you even pretend to separate those things? Um, well, I mean, you hope at the end of the day that um, that the executive directors are, are voting and doing, you know, the right thing for the world, but there is, you know, definitely, particularly in this day and age where you have China there and Russia there, uh, you know, uh, and the same thing, I'm, you know, that's happening at the UN. I mean, I, I think, was it just the G20 where they couldn't agree on a communique? The last World Bank, I think the the um, last fall, they couldn't come up with a communique because nobody can agree on how to discuss the Ukraine invasion. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it's a problem, and you know most countries are going to act in in their own own interest. Um, you know, including the United States. Obviously, we have um, you know national security and economic goals, um, and we're not the only ones. Yeah, I guess to me, and we don't need to belabor it because it's really not the intent of the conversation, but I see it a bit, you know, as like a, an investor in a former life, you don't try to pretend like biases don't exist. You have to acknowledge that they exist and then try to build organizations to uh, account for that, right? So to me, like trying to pretend that something that is so clearly political is apolitical <laughs> is just yeah. sort of silly. It is. Um, I 100% I, I agree with you. And I mean, the crazy, I mean, again, I could talk for hours about some of the crazy stories coming out of that. Yeah, what's your favorite story what, that you can share? Like, what's your favorite story that you can share with us? Um, I mean, there are a lot, but, um, uh, well, I mean, so the one where I, I almost got, like, you know, censored, I guess. So, by the way, everything that happens at the board is sort of behind um, closed doors. Um, I, 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 ironically, the World Bank is one of the least transparent organizations I've ever worked at, um, even though it's like sort of government on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally owned by the population of the world. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I think after 12 years, maybe they post what, what you know, what's said at the board meetings. Um, but uh, we had an issue with, uh, and this is really going down the rabbit hole, uh, an education project. Uh, and by the way, most projects are not actually education projects, but it was an education project in Tanzania. It was a um, uh, pretty big project for the World Bank, $700 million. Um to um, essentially create a separate school system for pregnant schoolgirls, 
Um, and so the issue in, in Tanzania that's actually quite sad is that, um, you know, so these schools are sometimes in rural areas and they're not close. And there were, a, there was a, you know, a preponderance of, of girls who were getting raped on their way to school, which is obviously quite sad. Mm. Uh, and the government had this policy that pregnant girls weren't allowed to go to school. And so they were getting kicked out of school. And actually, the nice thing actually about the World Bank and, and being, you know, part of the U.S. government system is, my office, I had, you know, folks from the State Department, Department of Commerce, AID, a lot of folks from Treasury. Uh, and so, you know, when there were these issues, often I would be in touch with the embassy. And so I was in touch with, you know, our uh, deputy charge down in Tanzania, who felt very, very strongly about this issue as a woman with children, as am I. Um, and, you know, she had gone to these schools and she told me that the, you know, school teachers would actually feel the girls bellies and chests. And that was their pregnancy test. And if they, they thought they were pregnant, they got kicked out. So this World Bank project was actually setting up a, a school for pregnant girls, like an alternative, they called it an alternative pathway. And I felt like as an American, you know, we got rid of these, it's essentially a segregated school system in Brown v. Board 60 years ago. And I just sort of was questioning the project and, you know, the uh, what the laws were in Tanzania uh, and in fact, actually, um, a uh, opposition leader came to see me at the bank and I pulled together a bunch of my European colleagues to listen to what he said. And he was running against the president. By the way, Tanzania has pretty repressive uh, government, as you can imagine. Uh, and that opposition leader got came back home and was arrested just for having met with me. Uh, and then next thing I knew, the foreign minister came to see me with this huge entourage. <laughs> Um, uh, but anyway, getting to the, the point of your question, um, so uh, because the World Bank is in D.C. and because the U.S. has been very generous with taxpayer dollars, Congress does actually pay attention. They're just up the street from the bank. And so we had uh, a, a U.S. senator who, you know, was saying, you have to vote against this project. I'm going to hold all the World Bank funding, you know, until you stop this. And I was like, I'm planning on voting against it, but I'm only one <laughs> for 24 other votes. And I actually was being pressured by a bunch of European countries to vote for it because they're like, it's better than nothing. And I'm like, I'd rather make it a better project and wait. Uh, but anyway, so I, you know, at a board meeting, I said, look, I, I just need to explain to you what the U.S. political issue is, which is we give the money and the people who appropriate the money are pretty unhappy with this project. And I got censored. They're like, you can't talk about politics at the, at the World Bank board. And I'm like, what? <laughs> So they tried to like strike my comments from the record, the general counsel. Anyway, I, I think in 12 years from now, I actually do think I won that argument and my comments will be included. <laughs> well, so what happened to the project? I mean, I actually think that's a, um, yeah, I mean, was it, was it, so it didn't, did it get withheld? And then did the political forces project, force So in fact, having that congressional pressure and the power of the purse helped me. Uh, go back to bank staff who went back to the Tanzanian government to make the project better. Um, and so, you know, they assured us that they would stop sort of feeling girls to make sure that they weren't pregnant. And they assured me that these were not separate and unequal, that these were just exactly the same schools, but they were just like a safer place for these girls to be, et cetera, et cetera. So we, you know, we pushed through some good changes to the program. And the bank was highly aware that it was a controversial project and they're going to be monitoring it very, very closely. Good. Yeah. No, that's, yeah, crazy. It would be very cool, um, but probably stressful to deal with such like real, right? Like, I don't, there's not a right answer in that debate. And right. it sounds like you ended up sort of in a compromise that it's yeah. like kind I of mean, the it same. Was, it was a really, because I mean, I obviously, I want to help those poor pregnant right. people. Like they need an education and you know my sort of joke was like you can't just teach them basket weaving because that's obviously like a u.s idiom and they were in fact teaching them basket oh my weaving gosh. because that's like a local you know <laughs> local yeah craft. but they were also getting you know other education as well so sure yeah, yeah I mean, almost the, the, the funny part was so i told you the foreign minister came to see me with the ambassador so this was entourage of what 20 people and i was a little nervous you know seeing them this was actually right when COVID hit and uh, and I said, I'll meet with you. I don't want any cameras or, you know, any press releases, whatever. And, and so they actually did take a picture of me and the foreign minister doing like a soccer kick hello, because it was the beginning of the pandemic. 
Uh, and they secretly videotaped the meeting. One of the staffers had, you know, their iPhone taping the whole meeting and they took, you know, so my, me and my staff are sitting here and they're sitting across the table with these flags behind me. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, so it was like, hi, nice to meet you. And we're shaking, shaking, you know, shaking our heads and smiling. And they took that video and ran it on a loop and put it on Tanzanian television saying that the U S had agreed to let the project through. So yeah, so we had to have the State Department call, you know, <laughs> the government and tell them to take it down. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. yeah, it almost feels like the, the first thing that went through my head is you told the background of that project and some of the political pressure would have been to say, fine, we'll make it a different school. But here are the obligations, like find the nonprofit in the U.S. that is bringing laptops, and, right? Just make it way better. <laughs> and yeah. Use that as a way to like you know, sort of, sort of super or jump, sort of leapfrog the problem altogether. Right. Uh, <laughs> fascinating. Okay. Well, um, uh, yeah, we digress a little bit, I, although I, education is such an important topic. Um, but yeah, so come back then to, um, to energy. So a couple years at the World Bank and, and tell us about all of the things that you're doing now and um, sure. yeah, uh, what, what you're most excited about. Sure. So um, there was a lot of discussion at the bank uh, at the time, again, pre-Russia invasion uh, about, you know, green energy projects. And I am all for, you know, green energy when, you know, I'm, a, I'm for all the above strategy, you know, when it makes sense. I mean, the issue is the World Bank is structured, as I said, it's supposed to be like bottom up. It's supposed to be client, client centric, client meaning the sovereigns. And so, you know, the sovereigns you know, when you're struggling to eat or you don't have schooling or your government is, you know, corrupt or you don't have roads, you know, that's supposed to be the sovereigns that, and, and this is a, there's a negotiation for these five-year plans, country, uh, country, perform, country plans. Um, and so uh, I, you know, I used to argue quite a bit with the Europeans who were like, we can only do green energy. This is all we can, you know, this is it. And I kept saying like, well, let's hear what, you know, what the, our clients want. Um, and, you know, obviously we're all concerned about, you know, climate change, uh, man-made climate change and, and how we're going to address it. But um, it got to the point where the Europeans were voting against all oil and gas projects, um, which uh, I understand we don't want to sort of continue uh, increasing greenhouse gas emissions, except like when you're looking at Africa, there's something like two to three percent of all climate change. And, you know, it's a development bank and, and uh, I, the former foreign minister, I want to say of Honduras, I hope I'm getting that right, um, Juan Jose Daoub, who was actually the number two at the bank, I just, I, I went to a small talk that he gave a few weeks ago, and he was talking about the bank's, you know, green agenda, and he said, look, he said, you know, if, if, if you're drowning in the ocean, you don't want to be told that you're getting swimming lessons, you want to be given a life preserver, and then you'll take the swimming lessons. <laughs> and, you know, I thought that was a, you know, very, you know, interesting way to think about it. And, and uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that is, you know, an issue there's in the, you know, in the history of mankind, humankind, there's really no example of a country that has um, developed without, you know, safe, secure, affordable, um, you know, abundant energy. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, when you talk about green energy, which again, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it, but, you know, we, I, I feel like in a sense, the policy is ahead of the technology, which in Washington, as I'm sure, you know, is a little bit unusual. Usually the policymakers and the regulators are, are way behind, you know, like the, the internet <laughs> and I mean, every possible technology, like they're catching up and then you're usually it takes them like 20, 20 years to catch up. And here I feel like, you know, we're pushing uh, a technology that, you know, it, it cannot, you know, we still don't have base load capacity, the battery storage isn't there. Um, and, and in a sense, you know, we're uh, basically trading out a fossil dependent economy for a mineral dependent economy. And at least for the United States, fossil dependent, we are or were energy independent. Um, and, and in fact, we're now exporting a lot of our oil to Europe. Uh, and, uh, and you know, so we're independent. We, you know, also uh, we're dealing with some Middle Eastern countries who don't like us very much, but generally we're independent versus, you know, a mineral dependent uh, economy. That's basically China, who we know doesn't like us very much. <laughs> And there, you know, a lot of those minerals are being dug up in, in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, by these poor little children, like, like these four, five-year-old, 10-year-old children. And there's been a lot of reporting on that. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things I, I would say to my European, you know, counterparts is, 
um, your, uh, you know, this, this, the, the green, uh, you know, trying to transition is this green agenda is going to come into direct conflict with the bank's human rights agenda and environmental agenda. Because, you know, there, as Milton Friedman famously said, there is no free lunch. Um, you know, so yes, there are negative externalities for oil and gas. There are also negative externalities for, you know, gr green energy, and we can't ignore those. Yeah, it seems, how has that tone or conversation shifted, I guess, over the last 12 to 24 months? I mean, you don't have, you don't, I don't think you have to convince me of anything that you just said, if any it was pretty obvious, I think, that uh, replacing something that's dispatchable with something that isn't uh, just doesn't work and is bound to go poorly at some point. And I think it just happened earlier, maybe, than I had expected. Um, and not all driven by macro either, right? Yeah. I, mean, I think I think that people conflate those two things. It was exacerbated by the, the macro event, but it was happening for six months prior to yeah. the invasion. So, like, how has that changed those conversations? Yeah, and I mean, you know... It talking about the macro, right? I mean, green energy still needs to be heavily subsidized. Uh, and, you know, we're all, I think the West is sort of living in this bubble that we think if we can just reduce our, you know, that's the, you know, mitigation and adaptation, if we can just, you know, do that, it'll all be fine. Well, nobody's talking about what China is doing and what India is doing. And so like, if green energy is so great, how come it A, needs to be subsidized and B, if it's so great, the people making all the green energy in China are still building more coal. <laughs> so, I mean, well, it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty energy intensive to create polysilicon <laughs> panels. So if you can do it with cheap coal, you're going to do it with cheap coal. Right. So, but I mean, and they're not just building coal in China. They're building a lot of coal all, all over Africa. And I mean, I got in an argument once with my German counterpart, um, who was a member of the Green Party, uh, a member of the bank is supposed to be apolitical. Uh, and, you know, uh, I said, you know, let's, I, I, I'm for green, but like, let's have a discussion about the negative externalities. Oh, and by the way, I used to walk around with this little chart book. I'm like, since, you know, since you guys signed the Paris Agreement, look at how much more gas you have imported from Russia. Right. And it was like everybody, every country in Europe, way, way up. Again, this is pre invasion. Nobody saw it coming. I was like, I just don't think, A, you guys should be that dependent on Russia. And B, you're preventing all these African countries from exploiting their natural gas. Well, you're doing, it's just very hypocritical. And, and I mean, you're seeing this now. A lot of these African countries are coming out and they're really upset that they feel like, why aren't they allowed to develop? Uh, and I mean, there's obviously, there's, that's, a, that's a huge tension. I mean, I, I, I understand why they're, they're angry about that. And, and now, as if to in, add insult to injury, the Europeans are stopping those projects at the World Bank and they're importing the gas from those African countries. <laughs> yeah. So they want the Africans have their own gas, but they're willing to buy it to fuel their own economy. It's totally crazy, I and mean, the right, and the only solution is for those countries to end up burning coal. <laughs> You're seeing those yeah, Well, and that was one of the points, which is what they're doing. And by the way, it's China that's building those, you know, coal plants. So, uh, I mean, and that's unfortunate because you know coal is the, <laughs> the dirtiest fuel out there. I mean, even the Germans turn their coal plants back on, uh, and they've had to extend the life of their nuclear plants. Uh, you know, which is like they Germany, I think, sort of did everything backwards, which was they cut off nuclear long before they were ready. <laughs> and so that increased their coal emissions. Yeah. So. Yeah. It seems, I mean, everything you just described, like, I, I mean, I'm personally a big proponent of nuclear just because it accomplishes all of those things that coal and gas already do just without the emissions. So, right. I mean, yeah, maybe talk to me about what you see as potential solutions for this conflict, you know, nuclear, hydrogen, I don't know what crazy batteries people are talking about now these days. I mean, what, yeah, what, like, how do you, what's your argument for like what the next five to 10 years should look like to solve this problem? So, yeah, I mean, nuclear is, I think, going to have to be a part of it, whether people like it or not. Um, and I wrote a piece uh, in Foreign Affairs about it. I went to COP27 uh, and sort of I was sitting there thinking about it because nobody was, really was talking about nuclear. I, I I was thinking somebody surely has done the math on how to get to net zero. Like, what do we need to do to get to net zero? And nuclear is, you know, this these are, you know, uh, projections out of I, IEA, projections out of, you know, I can't remember if it was Oxford or Cambridge. Um, you know, yes, we're going to need a lot more nuclear, uh, and yet we're not building it. Uh, and, you know, <clears throat> again, <clears throat> nuclear has risks. There are definitely risks for nuclear. There are also risks. There are negative externalities for, for a green economy, too. So, uh, but I, you know, nuclear is 
obviously like, you know, very, very clean. Uh, it's cleaner than, than, you know, the, the other so-called, you know, green energies. Um, you know, the issue is it's, at least in the United States, really difficult to build, um, you know, vastly expensive cost overruns, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I think a lot of that is our regulatory process. Um, and I mean, obviously it's, it's, uh, there bad things can happen. You want there to be regulation, but you want it to be, um, you know, balanced enough that, these plants can get built. There are these new technologies out there that I think have a lot of promise. These SMRs, these small modular reactors, I think have a lot of promise. Um, they're smaller. They they'll be, they'll be less expensive. You can you know put them together. Like you can you know take a coal plant offline and put you know an SMR or two in that facility. You can connect directly to the grid. Um, there are also these micro reactors, which I have jokingly called a nuke in a suitcase because I think they're about the size of my, I haven't seen one, but I think they're about the size of my office. You can literally like load it on a plane, unload it, dig, you know, put it underground and flip a switch and you don't have to change the fuel reactors for 10 years. So that's like a really good substitute for diesel for small island states. Um, uh, and I know from my work at the bank, like I would, I, I do these brown bag lunches with, you know, some of my counterparts in other countries to say like, we ought to be talking about this because the world bank has a ban on nuclear finance, which I think in this day and age needs to be changed. I mean, uh, you know, the issue is if the bank isn't financing this stuff, who is? Well, the Russians are, <laughs> the Russians are building lots of nuclear plants all over the world. <laughs> so we have obviously no insight into what's going on there. And these countries are then getting locked into this Russian technology. And a lot of those um, loans are in, you know, they're ruble denominated. So uh, one of the things that, that, that I, you know, at COP is interestingly enough, uh, Egypt was the host, like Egypt is, they've got a $27 billion Soviet Russian uh, nuclear facility coming online. Why'd they go with the Russians? Because the Russians financed it for them. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, you really can't, just to kind of reemphasize the theme, I guess, you just really can't separate the politics from, from this. Right. Um, which, yeah, I mean, I think is, honestly, in my mind, like the biggest barrier to any real transition because we can't even agree on what it looks like. And so how the hell are we ever actually going to make progress? And I don't know how that gets solved. Like you're in a much better position to tell me if I'm being over dramatic, uh, overly dramatic, but it just feels like- No, I mean, like... I, I, I agree with you. I mean, it is, it's it's like, it's hard to get agreement on anything, on any topic, yeah. <laughs> let alone yeah. energy, right? I mean, so you, you don't have agreement in the United States, you don't have agreement between countries. You have different needs, right? Like the developing world, they want to become developed. That's their goal. <laughs> so, and they, they, you cannot develop without, you know, uh, you know, affordable <laughs> energy, uh, you know, access that uh, is sustainable. Yeah, yeah, crazy. Um, okay, yeah. So uh, we only have a few moments left here. Um, what, like, we have this conversation again in five years. Like, what are we talking about that you're the most proud of? Most proud of. Um, well, I would be really happy if the bank overturned their ban on nuclear finance. Um, you know, that was what I pushed for when I was there, and I'm uh, still trying to push for it from the outside. I, uh, you know, I don't know if they'll ever get there, but um, I think even if they just, you know, put together, you know, some kind of a trust fund where they started looking at, you know, whether they could provide technical assistance, I think that that would be very helpful because, you know, as I said, because the bank is not in this space. It allows, you know, some untrusted actors into that space. And it's not just the Russians. I mean, the, the Chinese obviously are, are um, uh, the Chinese are starting to get into the nuclear. I mean, they, they have nuclear domestically, but they're, they have one, I think it's in Pakistan. That they're doing, uh, they're exporting their technology. So That's, yeah, what, what is that process? Yeah, what's that conversation like? What's that process? Like, does, does anyone actually own that ban? Like, no one, like who can say yes? And yeah, like so how does that work? It's it's been written in the it's the 2012 energy position paper, um, and so that energy paper I think needs to be updated to you know say that the bank is open to investigating nuclear as a as a technology. So um, you know that would be the staff writing the paper. Um, potentially the board could could vote on it. Um, you know, there are all sorts of, you know, the issue is the board members come usually from either the finance or the aid ministries. Um, when in fact you need somebody from the energy and <laughs> energy uh, department, <laughs> that would be part of it that say like, yes, we should be doing, you know, we need to rethink this. We need to do nuclear. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it. I think, 
you know, five, 10 years from now, I mean, I think that, um, you know, the transition is, is going to, uh, I think it'll pr progress. Um, uh, you know, I think there are going to be a lot of hiccups along the way. I mean, you're already seeing it with like, you know, mineral critical rare earth mineral supply chain issues. Like I said, this sort of clash between the green agenda and the human rights and environmental agenda. Um, I think you're going to see, um, a lot of retrenchment, decoupling, uh, where, you know, each country's trying to secure their own supply chains, um, uh, you know, for that, uh, which, you know, sort of, I, I guess, you know, others have said like the era of globalization is over. I'm not convinced it's completely over. Um, I think trade in general is a good thing. I think it's it's got, you know, welfare benefits for consumers, um, but there are, you know, national and economic security implications for a lot of the stuff. And that's, that's what happened. That that's sort of a lesson learned from you know Putin's uh, invasion is uh, it's completely upended the entire you know energy market, and now you have what was already the beginning of a bifurcation, like a huge split between you know the West, and now you have China and Russia and their sort of satellite states with them, uh, and so you know Russian oil is now you know China and India are very happy they're getting a lot of cheap oil. <laughs> And now the U.S. is exporting a lot more to the Europeans. They've had to build, you know, LNG, you know, stations and, and that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. So we'll see. It's um, uh, interesting times that we live in. As the Chinese say, you, may you be cursed by living in interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly multifaceted. And I'm glad that someone with your background and intelligence is helping to work through it. Um, anything else that we didn't talk about that we should? I mean, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm for, I'm, you know, for all the above energy strategy. Um, and, you know, uh, we got really lucky this winter. It was a warm winter here. I mean, particularly the Europeans that would have been really, really bad if they had um, had a harsh winter. Um, so uh, the weather gods uh, shined upon uh, the planet for that, uh, which is good. And, you know, hopefully we'll see. I mean, it, maybe this conflict will end and, um, things will improve, uh, and we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I think it was an um, it was an expensive way to perhaps learn the wrong lesson, right? You had yeah. Germany buy a whole bunch of BCF of LNG at its absolute peak, and they oh, sort yeah. of got away with it. Um, so yeah, hopefully, yeah, hopefully luck continues to work out. But that was, oh, that's I think a one thing, uh, Jones Act. <laughs> I would really like to get, I would really like to reform the Jones Act, which which is why we can't take any of our, you know, any of our energy that's coming out of the Gulf Coast, like up to the East Coast, which why pre rush you know, pre Putin's invasion, we actually have Russian tankers like sitting off the coast of, of New Hampshire uh, because of our own uh, protectionist shipping laws, which basically have decimated our fleet. So and that one, uh, yeah, I, I've come across the Jones Act in various things. I know it's important on the offshore wind stuff, obviously the LNG stuff. Like, is that a real conversation? I mean, it feels like an easy answer, but um, I've, I've been hearing about people trying to get rid of that for probably Long time. Yeah. yeah, a decade. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, what is it? When was it passed? Nineteen twenty-six. 24 maybe something like that it's been on the books a long time so um yeah it's uh and i mean it's also like it impacts food aid it makes our food aid a lot more expensive yeah one thing i just wanted to point to is um uh the economic innovation group uh where i work um did uh, an interesting little analysis uh, we do a lot of mapping uh and so we did a map where we looked at um, counties that are getting the most sort of influx of um you know domestic migration movement, right? Like I'm not talking about illegal immigrants crossing the border, but you know, people moving from state to state. Uh, and then we mapped it against um, drought zones. And so, you know, you can imagine like the Sun Belt, you know, particularly like Arizona, you know, the Mountain West, all of those states, uh, you know, particularly since COVID have had a lot of people moving to them. And those are also the places that are most susceptible to drought. So I think, you know, that that's part of this climate change conversation, which is, OK, if we're going to have more people moving to these places, how are we going to deal with, you know, a lot of the, the resource issues, which includes water? Sort of just exacerbating our own challenges without knowing it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, OK, well, we heard it here. You're going to solve the uh, nuclear at the World Bank issue. You're going to get rid of the We're going to have a lot to talk about in five years. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome, DJ. Thanks so much for coming on. Sure. It's nice to be here. Bye-bye. Our leadership in science and industry, our hopes for peace and security, our obligations to ourselves 
as well as others, all require us to make this effort to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all men and for the progress of all people.